You can pause now and read to see how iceberg videos are structured. Let's get right into one of the craziest videos I've ever made. Alternative trading system. These are venues for matching large buy and sell transactions and aren't regulated as tightly as exchanges that we trade on, like the New York Stock Exchange or CME for most futures traders. Examples of these systems include dark pools as well as electronic communication networks. Think of alternative trading systems as the encompassing term, the umbrella. In Europe, they're referred to as multilateral trading facilities. Between 2013 and 2015, these systems accounted for about 18% of all stock trading, quadrupling from its percent in 2005. One of the fraudulent activities going on has to do with trading against customer order flow, but these systems are legal and are regulated by the SEC. So yeah, there's some fraud going on, of course. Okay, primary market. There are four levels to markets, and this will be important later. A primary market is the source for new stocks and bonds. This is when you're actually buying it from the source, instead of in traditional trading, where you're just exchanging assets with other traders and investors. Anonymous trading. Certain market participants want to keep their identity anonymous. You can't hide executed orders from everyone, but you can hide who you are. Certain participants will do this to avoid tipping off people about what they might be doing, such as slowly building up a large position in a certain company. This can be done now in the regular exchanges, but many of the big players are doing this through the alternative trading systems such as dark pools. One thing to think about is that the action of showing up as anonymous in order to hide your identity and to avoid the eyes of others can achieve the thing it's trying to prevent. Level 2. Secondary Markets This is typically what people are trading on. This is where most trading is taking place with shares that have already been purchased from a company's IPO. The New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, and the other names that easily come to mind are secondary markets. Dark pools. These started as a way to reduce the impact of large orders on the market. Instead of submitting a huge sell order and causing a big impact, this exchange can be done privately outside of the exchange. Exchange. Since the big players are here, they can get better deals on orders by just exchanging directly with each other. However, their trades are supposedly anonymous. It's just big players exchanging orders with each other while avoiding exchange fees. Too many exchanges. There are clear advantages for large players, but the anonymity provided by it can lead to price divergence from public markets as well as some pretty serious other shenanigans. We will get into that further down the iceberg. Electronic communication networks. These allow people to trade without a third party involved. That means no market maker. They provide the same privacy as dark pools. They automatically match and execute orders at the best available bid and ask quotes from market participants. This happens during regular trading hours, but another reason for their existence is that they provide the ability to trade outside of traditional trading hours. Remember that like dark pools, ECNs are a type of alternative trading system. Access fees and commission charges can be pretty expensive, and the platforms aren't as user friendly as the ones that most of us use. Instanet was the first ECN, which was founded in 1969. Nice. Block Trading Facility NASDAQ has one called NASDAQ Private Markets. Makes sense. It's geared towards accredited and institutional traders, and apparently it reported trades worth $30 billion in the first three months of 2021. It allows two parties to exchange a large order privately outside of the public order books. This prevents the impact of large orders, and it mostly occurs between large financial institutions like banks and hedge funds. This is usually managed by a brokerage specializing, <laughs> specializing primarily in large trades. Think of it as a private transaction between two parties. Nothing is truly private though. The trades still have to be reported, and the trading data is published alongside daily exchange volume. Level 3. The Third Market I'm pretty sure this is just like the secondary market, except it's for over-the-counter securities, which is not done on the main exchanges like the New York Stock Exchange. Instead, this trading is done through a broker-dealer network. This is operating outside of a centralized exchange, over-the-counter. GME. This one's interesting, and is best described from a post in r slash superstonk by this guy. Essentially, he found through publicly viewable reports that 24% of GME's float was traded in dark pools. In the companies he compared, their combined average was just 0.91%, and the next highest one in that list was only 2.29%. His research also revealed just how much dark pools have changed over the years. Their original purpose was for large orders, but the report showed that GameStop trades averaged less than 50 shares per trade. Dark pools were being used to trade GameStop more than 20 times more than any other stock he checked. 
It's r slash super stonk, so it's self-aware confirmation bias about why they should continue to bag hold and wait for GME to short squeeze. Maybe they're geniuses, maybe not. I don't know. Only time will tell. The New York Stock Exchange president on dark pools. Here is a direct quote from the president of the New York Stock Exchange. Yep. In some of the meme stocks that we've seen, or stocks that have a high level of retail participation, the vast majority of order flow can trade off of exchanges, which is problematic. That price formation is not really reflective of what supply and demand is. End quote. I'm sure this interview can be found somewhere, but I'm just doing a short entry on it. Essentially, the interesting thing to take from this is the dis the okay. Essentially, the interesting thing to take from this is the supply and demand comment. If dark pools are operating independently of the driving force of markets, aka supply and demand, then what are the implications of that? Hmm. Level four. Inside quote. This one was tough to actually understand. On one hand, traders receive the best price available in relation to what's publicly viewable, like the bid ask spread in the order book. You're not gonna get filled worse than what the order book shows. One form of an inside quote is when a dark pool is offering a price somewhere between the bid ask, except we don't know that exists because that's the point of the dark pools. We only know this happened if later we see the transaction show up on the time in sales. If you experience price improvement after an order is routed through a dark pool or hidden order, then that's because of an inside quote. This one's a little confusing and I've read it at least four times. The 10 second rule. No matter how much hiding any of the alternative trading systems like dark pools provide, you still can't really hide anything. All trades have to be reported within 10 seconds to the trade reporting facility run by the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, or FINRA. Even with that 10 second rule, most of them are reported basically instantly. The fourth market. This term is used interchangeably with dark pools, and you'll see why. These markets are private exchanges that are only for trades between institutional investors. This goes on without the rest of us being able to see it, but of course you have to remember the 10 second rule. This is set up by independent companies or by institutions themselves. Flash boys. No, don't do that. The, it's just, never mind. Michael Lewis wrote a book called Flash Boys, A Wall Street Revolt. In it, Lewis described a time when Rich Gates and his colleagues created a test to see if they would get ripped off in dark pools. They conducted hundreds of tests in many different dark pools, and this was all done with their personal money. Apparently, there was only one firm whose dark pool yielded a positive test result. This was in the Goldman Sachs dark pool, where they got ripped off on over 50% of the trades. What defines ripped off? I'm not sure. But personally, I don't need a whole lot of perfectly described research results to believe it's likely that a bank such as Goldman Sachs wasn't being super duper ethical. Another thing mentioned in this book was that by 2012, the volume of stock trading in dark pools and internalizers was 40% of all trading volume. Wow. Level 5! Order 34-57620. Prior to 2008, Qualified contingent trades required trades to be a minimum of 10,000 shares or $200,000 in value in dark pools. And remember what I said earlier about the size of GameStop shares being only 50? This order removed that limitation, and now there's no size requirements since according to the order, CBOE believed that removing the size condition would not result in a large increase in the number of transactions being exempted from Rule 611 because smaller contingent trades represented a very small portion of the overall amount of stock executions in listed stocks. Of course, that's not how it went, and now smaller trades are a very significant portion of the executions. Legal Insider Trading a website called WallStreetOnParade.com does some fantastic journalism on Wall Street in the finance world mostly on how corrupt they are. Here's a quote from May 6th of this year. Not only are Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, UBS, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, and numerous others allowed to trade hundreds of New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ listed stocks in their own dark pools, but they are also allowed to trade their own bank stock in their own dark pools. We have asked the SEC for years now how it is legal for a bank to trade its own stock, possibly making a two-sided market in that stock, because some of these firms own more than one dark pool. We've yet to receive an answer. End quote. Wow. Pinging. Pinging is an insane concept to me, solely because it's just crazy to think about what people can accomplish when they are properly funded and the end goal is to make money. The world of finance attracts some really, really smart people. Anyways, pinging is when a high frequency trading firm throws out a bunch of small orders in order to try and find large orders in dark pools. 
That is so cool. Once these orders are detected, the firm then front runs it and makes a profit at the expense of that dark pool participant. So the firm basically buys up all those shares and then hopes to sell them all to the institutional buyer, obviously for slightly more expensive in order to make a profit. That's crazy. They're just like sniping things right from out the un under them. Take the t stealing them. Hut. They scoop them up right before someone else is supposed to get them and then they give it to that person who's originally going to get it for a slightly higher price. Wow. Well, I forgot to write an outro, so now I'm just staring at my computer. I hope that was at least mildly interesting to you. Originally, this was going to be a dark pool just about trading in general. And while I was starting with dark pools, the more I got into it, I was like, holy crap, this is going to take forever. So this is a bit of an experiment. Hopefully this video does well, but it probably won't because I actually enjoyed making it. I would love to make more videos like this. I think icebergs are really fun ways to learn about a ton of information. Um, alright. Thanks for watching. If you want to see me trade live and, and learn publicly, then check out the channel in the description. And thank you so much to my patrons who got to see this video and every video I make early. Thank you so much. Bye bye.